Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Mallor Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis, lawmg.com. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. In some parts of the state, the COVID vaccination rate is hovering around 15 percent, and local health officials are struggling to make headway. We're in the position of, hey, you know, here's the information, take it or leave it. But don't get your information on health care from the, the local steel cutter. Ahead, the uphill climb to get people vaccinated as the highly infectious Delta variant takes hold in the state. Indiana's housing market is on fire. It's a dream for sellers and a nightmare for buyers. Supply is low and demand is high, and that drives price up. And police officers from across the country gathered in Terre Haute this week to remember a veteran police officer killed in the line of duty. Those stories, plus the latest news from across the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. And many of us here would have called it simply the civil. Welcome to Indiana News Desk. I'm Joe Wren. The state has reported more than 500 new cases of COVID-19 for the past four days, reversing a trend from the past two months. And almost half of the new cases are of the Delta variant, which officials say is up to 40 times more transmissible than the original strain. More than 2.8 million Hoosiers have been fully vaccinated against COVID-19, but that's still less than 50% of those eligible in the state. These variants have been shown to be more infectious and may cause more severe illness. And the vaccine is still the most effective tool that we have to protect the people we love. Indiana and its public health officials are entering a new stage in the fight against COVID-19. But in the state's least vaccinated county, it's an uphill climb. Brock Turner brings us the first of two reports on what the state is doing to get shots in arms. In LaGrange County, Indiana, one in five residents are fully vaccinated against COVID-19. For health officials, the hopes of herd immunity via a vaccine is just that. I think getting herd immunity through vaccine is a fool's errand in our county. Dr. Thomas Peachin is the county's health officer and has practiced medicine here for 30 years. Many of the challenges he faces are present throughout the state. We have plenty of access to vaccine. We have plenty of education. There's been plenty of information shared with people. And basically, people are making their own decisions, and that's the way America should work. So, and we have a great hospital system that can take care of people when they're sick. So, um, we're in the position of, hey, you know, here's the information, take it or leave it. But don't get your information on health care from the, the local steel cutter, okay? Get it from somebody who knows what the heck they're talking about. One of the other local health authorities is the owner of Topeka Pharmacy, Trevor Thane. I bought the store in 2018 and then um, my wife and I got married and she's a pharmacist as well. And so she and I have been um, working here and running it now for three and a half years. Thane played an integral part in a state program which funneled COVID vaccines to pharmacies shortly after they were available. He believes it was successful, but demand has dried up. In the last month or so, I've seen a pretty sharp decline in the demand for the shots instead of doing you know, 60 or 70 a day and ordering three or 400 doses a week. Um, you know, we're getting maybe 100 doses a week and just, you know, 10 appointments, you know, here or there on a day and taking walk-ins now. Thane even says he's made house calls and stayed after hours to help those who might have scheduling or other conflicts. But you wouldn't know it when looking at the data. In multiple LaGrange County zip codes, fewer than 15 percent of residents are fully vaccinated. A large Amish population resides here. Local health officials say they've struggled vaccinating and combating factually questionable information in the community. 
A group that serves as liaisons between the Amish and health care providers declined to comment for this story. But the low vaccination rate can't be blamed exclusively on any single group. Last month, CDC officials toured the county, but local leaders say federal health authorities didn't offer any real solutions. I don't think there's a universal you know, magic bullet that'll fix everything. I think there's so many things intertwined into this thing, uh, whether it's politics, religion, culture. I mean, all of that somehow got mixed into just something that's just black and white science. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it's, it's really tough. Indiana ranks in the bottom half of doses administered by state per 100,000 residents. So obviously we're disappointed. We would rather be higher with, with our percentage of fully vaccinated individuals. Last week, the state's top health officials admitted the vaccination efforts have hit a wall. We knew there would come a time when we would go from people, you know, very, very anxious to get the vaccine and are not having enough to a time when we were really working very hard to get that next individual to be vaccinated. For healthcare workers in LaGrange County, that's a daily fight. I've got more uh, bags under my eyes and gray hair and actually just less hair than, uh, than I, when I started this back at, you know, before March last year. Thane and Peachin both worry about a variant, like Delta, that is more transmissible spreading here among the unvaccinated. A surge in cases could quickly overwhelm the local hospital. But both insist they're invested, and in spite of the struggles, will continue to work for what they know is in the best interest of residents. Because if, if we don't do it, nobody will. Um, and, and that's, you know, we have a handful of people in the community that are very like-minded with me on that. It's my community. It's these these are people I know, and I very good people. You know, they just they just have misinformation, and you know my challenge is try to correct that. And it's been it's been a real uphill climb. It's just, uh, um, and it's it's not over yet. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Brock Turner. Next week, we'll look at how one county is taking an innovative approach in trying to get its residents vaccinated. Now for headlines, we go over to Ethan Burks, who has the latest on this week's top stories. Thanks, Joe. Indiana officials say more analysis is needed to understand the full academic impact of COVID-19 during the last school year. Statewide iLearn data shows just under 29% of the state's third through eighth graders passed the math and English portions. Education Secretary Katie Jenner says the results shouldn't be used to criticize schools or educators in unusual circumstances. This data cannot be an indictment on anyone, on anything, on any school. The reality is all of us had a global pandemic. The state is in the first phase of a COVID-19 academic study. Experts say looking at students' rate of learning is key to understanding academic recovery. An early analysis of available data suggests it will likely take at least one year of supplemental support for students across the state to get back on track in math. Diana Medina Flores was sentenced to 65 years in prison for the murder of her 12-year-old stepson earlier this week in Monroe County Court. Her husband, Luis Poso, is also being charged for torturing and starving their son to death. His case is currently being appealed. Right now, the state, which is represented by the Attorney General in the appellate process, uh, is working on its brief, which is due to be filed August 2nd. In 2019, deputies discovered the couple and their son staying at the Bloomington Economy Inn on State Road 37 South. They found a box containing constraints and a canine shock collar in the motel room. Cell phone footage later showed both were used on the child, which led to his death. The Environmental Protection Agency is considering regulating PFAS and more than 60 other contaminants in drinking water. PFAS is a group of chemicals found in everything from nonstick pans to firefighting foams that polluted groundwater at military bases around the country. Indiana Public Broadcasting's Rebecca Thiel reports. Exposure to PFAS has been linked to health problems with the immune system, infant birth weights, and in some cases, cancer. Indiana University professor Jackie McDonald Gibson is studying PFAS in rural water in Indiana and three other states. She says some states that have tried to regulate PFAS have faced lawsuits from manufacturers. Drinking water utilities also have to install new, expensive systems to remove them. To be successful, any new regulations would really have to come with an enormous increase, I think, in federal financial support. Just because a contaminant gets on the EPA's candidate list doesn't mean the agency will control it in drinking water. 
In the past, the EPA has looked into regulating hundreds of chemicals in water, but has only chosen a handful from each previous list. There's definitely a need for a regulation of some sort to control PFAS in drinking water. Um, they're very widespread. A recent study suggested that these contaminants are present in as many as two-thirds of U.S. drinking water supplies. For Indiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Rebecca Thiel. Hoosiers will get a refund when they file their taxes next year. That's because the state finished the year with a lot more revenue than expected, triggering Indiana's automatic taxpayer refund. In just the last three months, Indiana brought in $1.2 billion more than projected. The refund will show up as a tax credit when people file next year. The exact amount per person won't be determined until later this year. A federal judge in South Bend says he will very soon come up with a decision in a lawsuit brought on by eight students against Indiana University's COVID-19 vaccine policy. The students are challenging the legality of the policy, which mandates students, staff, and faculty to be vaccinated before returning to campus next month. They're also questioning the requirements the university places on exempted individuals, restrictions such as face mask, face mask wearing on campus, and increased mitigation testing. Bloomington's old Kmart location on East 3rd Street is being converted into 340 new apartments, but some city officials and residents are concerned about increased traffic. Could be looked at in the future if, if traffic gets to be worse, uh, to put in four-way stops, uh, you know, that just kind of depends on traffic movements and counts. The complex called District at Latimer Square will have over 900 bedrooms. The site plan includes 535 parking spaces, as well as a 378 space parking garage on the southwest, southwest corner of the property. The project is expected to be completed by July 2023. A bee microbe that lives inside the guts of queen honeybees and their larvae protects them from deadly funguses, according to new research from IU. Researchers hope the discovery will lead to medicine that could help worker bees, antifungal treatments for people, or something to prevent food from spoiling. IU graduate student Delaney Miller is the lead author of the study. And so there's the potential that, you know, once we identify the structure of this um, metabolite, that it could be developed as a pesticide for agriculture that we know would not be damaging in any way to the pollinators. Several insecticides meant to kill pests on farms also harm honeybees and other pollinators. More than 40% of honeybee colonies in the U.S. die every year, threatening the nation's food security. And that's all the time we have for headlines. Back to you, Joe. Okay, Ethan, thank you very much. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. Low supplies and high demand have driven housing prices up and made house buying an adventure. And the state is resuming extra federal unemployment benefits it shut off last month. Ahead, what that means for unemployed Hoosiers. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. Stay close to Indiana News Desk as we trace education issues all the way from the Capitol to your child's classroom. So many topics that arise each year in the State House affect what happens every day in the schoolhouse. The WTIU News Team is committed to helping you stay up to date with the issues that affect your family's future. Keep yourself informed. Tune in to Indiana News Desk, your source for regional and state in-depth news. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. The city of Terre Haute and the law enforcement community are grieving the loss of another police officer killed in the line of duty. Adam Pinsker reports hundreds of people came out to remember Detective Greg Ferency this week. This is a memorial set up in front of the Terre Haute Police Department for Detective Greg Ferency. On Tuesday, he was laid to rest almost a week after he was shot to death near the FBI headquarters here in Terre Haute. Law enforcement from around the country and around Indiana came to pay their respects. The body of fallen Terre Haute police officer Greg Ferency makes the final journey past the police department where he served for almost three decades. Construction workers and bystanders stopping to pay their respects. I was just devastated to think another one of our officers had been killed in the line of duty. Susan Martis had a personal connection to Ferency's family. She was the principal at Woodrow Wilson Middle School where Ferency's two children attended a few years back. 
I also um, know Greg's parents, Dottie and Mike, and then I had the children in school. And just to think of them losing their father just as they've graduated from high school. In addition to his duties as a Terre Haute police officer, Ferency worked out of the city's local FBI office where he assisted the agency with breaking up drug and human trafficking networks. Colleagues who eulogized Ferency say he was meticulous about his work, but also kind and professional. Unassuming, humble, down to earth, he could and would talk to anyone. Some people even came back to thank him for being so kind and so professional while he arrested them. Ferency died after confronting a man who threw a Molotov cocktail into the FBI office. The suspect shot him before leaving the scene. It's heartbreaking to think that somebody that's trying to keep us safe loses their life doing what, what is right, what we need. And um, it just affects, it's like a ripple. You know, when you have something like this, it just ripples out. This is the third time in the past decade a Terre Haute police officer has lost his life in the line of duty. It's a trend that worries Terre Haute's mayor. Everybody will tell you there's cops out there that have made bad decisions and that they need to be dealt with. But that is such a small minority of police officers very small and we just need to get back to that law and order sense the suspect in this case shane Meehan, was charged with murdering a federal officer that's because detective ferency served on an fbi task force here in Terre Haute. for indiana news desk i'm adam pinsker well buying a home is one of the biggest decisions you can make but a lack of supply has complicated the process for many mitch legan reports a year ago, the average house in Monroe County went for $266,000. Today, the average sale price is $303,000. It's a seller's dream and has been a nightmare for many buyers. But realtor Steve Smith says it's simple economics. That's supply and demand. And supply is low and demand is high. And that drives price up. And it, it's a little bit like a feeding frenzy. The Indiana Association of Realtors says almost 50% fewer homes are for sale now compared to last year. In Monroe County, there are 150 fewer houses on the market, down 30%. Nearby Brown, Lawrence, and Morgan counties tell a similar story. The lack of supply, increased demand, record low mortgage rates, and pandemic lockdowns created the perfect housing frenzy. Buyers are doing just about everything to secure homes. This came on the market at noon, I noticed it. And at 2 p.m. I was in the car <laughs> driving down for a 7.30 p.m. showing and put the offer in at 10 p.m. Aiken lived in Chicago for decades but began thinking during the pandemic of moving back home to Bloomington. When he bought his home in Chicago, he took his time and compared offers. That doesn't work today. Back then you had negotiated and you threw in an offer below asking, of course, and then you worked it down, worked it down. Here it's maybe you started asking but if you really want it, you, you go above asking. With potential buyers willing to go thousands over asking price, the median home price in the state has jumped more than $30,000 in the last year. Buyers are willing to pay cash, waive appraisals, even skip inspections. It was just so crazy because you would go to these house viewings and there would be like three or four other families there at the same time and there'd be real estate agents with their cell phones like doing virtual tours and it was just crazy. McGuire and her husband landed a house in Fishers after months of searching and are now packing up to move. She says they wouldn't have been able to outbid their competition. It was a handwritten letter that sealed the deal for them. A real estate agent called us and she said, oh, well, you know, they did receive, you know, multiple offers. Yours was not the best, but they loved your letter and they want to, you know, counter offer X, Y, Z and they will give it to you. And it was just like, what, what? But not everyone looking for a home will luck out with a letter. The serious price hikes and supply shortages are leaving many first-time or low-income buyers on the sidelines. The National Association of Realtors reported last month an underbuilding gap of nearly 6 million housing units since 2001. If you look at the inventory of homes on the market, you know, something that's called a month supply of inventory. Uh, right now, that measure is below one month. And really, the kind of the rule of thumb for a, a, an even housing market is about six months of supply. Both Kinghorn and Smith agree the solution is more housing, but the price of building materials has increased since the pandemic. 
And with the market on fire as it is, it makes more sense financially to build more expensive homes. We're starting to see more construction, and hopefully with that construction, we start to see it more at that kind of starter home end of the market rather than the higher end of the market. That's really what we're going to need to, to kind of bring some normalcy back to the market. Smith says if you're looking for a house, the key is patience and perseverance. The market has shown signs of possibly easing in the distant future, but it'll stay hot as the summer continues. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Mitch Legan. Federal unemployment benefits are again flowing to unemployed Hoosiers this week after an Indiana Court of Appeals ruling. Now, the court said Indiana must follow a lower court's order forcing it to restart a federal program that provides an extra $300 a week in unemployment benefits. The state ended that benefit and other COVID-19 relief programs last month. We're joined now by Indiana Public Broadcasting's Justin Hicks, who has been covering this story. Hello, J Justin, welcome. So federal benefits are restarting today. Why is the state changing its policy on these benefits? Yeah, of course, so uh, to put it bluntly, it's because there's a couple of judges and decisions that judges made that, that are making them do that. Um, so there's a line in Indiana's unemployment law that says the state must confer all the rights and benefits of federal unemployment to Hoosiers. So a group of pro bono lawyers from Indiana Legal Services took from the court uh, saying, yeah, hey, this violates law. Um, the case has not been decided yet, but they did get an emergency injunction affirmed by two different courts now uh, that says the state cannot end benefits because uh, they need to figure out that case, essentially. Um, so, I mean, I kind of liken this to, you know, if you're a football fan, it's kind of like, you really just need to kick a field goal here. That injunction was kind of like the field goal. It's not quite the touchdown, uh, but it's the field goal, and that's enough to win the game potentially and then to run out the clock uh, until September when these benefits would end anyways. So exactly what are the federal benefits that are restarting? Is it just some of the new programs? Yeah, so it's these new federal unemployment programs that we had never seen before the pandemic. Uh, so there is one called PUA, that's for your self-employed folks, uh, gig workers, folks who maybe otherwise wouldn't be eligible for regular unemployment insurance. That'll come back online. Uh, also PEUC, which gives people extra weeks of eligibility for unemployment. Um, in Indiana, they only get 26 weeks in the, in the program, so this will give an extra uh, 12 weeks, I believe, to that. Um, and another one, and this is the one that I think you highlighted before, uh, the $300, the extra $300 benefit will be coming back as well. And that goes for anybody, anybody on PUA, on uh, UI, regular UI. Uh, if you're making at least $1 uh, of benefits, if you're eligible for that, you will get an extra $300 as well starting now. All right, Justin, thank you very much for all of your coverage. Of course, thank you. Well, nearly 160 years ago this weekend, the southern Indiana town of Newburgh etched its place in American history when a group of Confederate raiders captured the town without firing a shot. Mitch Legan has more in this week's History Through Headlines. It was July 18th, 1862. Abraham Lincoln was president. Every day, the nation fell deeper into its bloody civil war. And along the Ohio River, Confederate raider Adam Rankin Johnson captured the town of Newburgh using a charred log and a stovepipe. The headline reads, Guerrilla Invasion. About 30 Confederate raiders, led by Adam Johnson, crossed the Ohio River from Kentucky to capture the port town of Newburgh and its supplies. But when the raiders landed in Union territory, nobody stopped them. Everybody was at lunch. You know, they were at home having lunch. I mean, you know, so nobody was guarding the warehouse. Nobody was guarding anything downtown. Odds are they had some help from Confederate sympathizers in town. They scrambled up the riverbank and quickly captured a warehouse full of guns and ammunition. After Johnson took the makeshift armory, he and some men came to this building and secured it before setting out to see what else they could find. The Confederates raided Newburgh in a matter of hours and warned if anyone tried to stop them, there were cannons across the river, ready to shell the town to the ground. Behind me across the river is basically where the two cannon were located. And that basically, uh, as I mentioned before, one was a stovepipe, which is black, and the other was a burnt log, which was black, and then they mounted them on wagon wheels. The make-believe cannons worked, and the raiders made off with weapons, horses, food, their leader even left with a new nickname, Stovepipe Johnson. 
It's kind of uh, a unique story in the fact that um, no shots were fired until later. Within days, a thousand troops were dispatched there to protect the town and return some of the goods. But it didn't save Newburgh from becoming the first town to surrender to a stovepipe. South called it the For Indiana News Desk, yeah, yeah. I'm Mitch and Legan. Many of us here would have called it simply the Civil. The Newburgh Museum is open Fridays and Saturdays from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. And that's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Mallor Grodner Attorneys providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis. LawMG.com. IU Alumni Association connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you.